Well, the big news of the morning is that FTX's Sam Bankman-Fried has now been arrested in the Bahamas. And there, there are some people who suspected that he actually would not be arrested because he gave tens of millions of dollars to Democrats in the last election cycle. But the actual strategy here apparently is he can give tens of millions of dollars to the Democrats in the last election cycle. After the election, we will arrest him, as it turns out. According to the New York Times, Sam Bankman-Fried, the disgraced founder of the collapsed cryptocurrency exchange FTX, was arrested in the Bahamas on Monday after U.S. prosecutors filed criminal charges. Quote, SBF's arrest followed receipt of formal notification from the United States that it has filed criminal charges against SBF and is likely to request his extradition, the government of the Bahamas said in a statement. The arrest was the latest stunning development in one of the most dramatic falls from grace in recent corporate history. Bankman Fried was scheduled to testify in Congress on Tuesday about the collapse of FTX, which was one of the most powerful firms in the emerging crypto industry until it imploded virtually overnight last month after a run on deposited deposits exposed an $8 billion hole in its accounts. Prosecutors for the Southern District of New York confirmed that Bankman Fried had been charged and said in an indictment that it would be unsealed on Tuesday. Separately, the Securities and Exchange Commission said in a statement it had authorized charges relating to Mr. Bankman Fried's violations of our securities laws. Now, the criminal charges against Bankman Fried included wire fraud, wire fraud conspiracy, securities fraud, securities fraud conspiracy, and money laundering, said one person with knowledge of the matter. Hilariously, there was apparently a WhatsApp group chat that included Sam Bankman Fried and his girlfriend, who ran Alameda Capital, which was the hedge fund connected to FTX, and it was called wire fraud, which is like... <laughs> Which, I'm sorry, that's, that's like the person whose password on their computer is still password. I, I wasn't committing wire fraud. I just had a group that was called wire fraud where we talked about committing wire fraud. Yeah, it's, that's awkward, guys. If you're going to commit the criminal activity, you probably should not actually label your group chats by the name of the criminal charge. Bankman Freed was the only person charged in the indictment. He was taken into custody by the Bahamian, Bahamanian authorities, according to a person. He was arrested shortly after 6 p.m. at his apartment complex in the Albany Resort in the Bahamas, according to a statement from Baham, Bahamian police. He was cooperative during the arrest. So we're going to find out more today on what exactly the charges are. But to recap this particular story, for those who missed it, FTX was the second largest crypto exchange in the world. It was basically built on sand. It did a good job of allowing people to exchange, buy, and sell crypto. But people were not taking their money out of crypto and then putting it in their crypto wallets. They're just leaving it in the exchange. They're letting it sit there on the exchange. And then Sam Bankman-Fried was apparently taking that money and handing it over to Alameda Capital, which was this associated hedge fund. Alameda Capital was using that money to buy up FTT, which was the cryptocurrency issued by FTX. So they were artificially inflating the price of FTT. And then Sam Bankman Fried and company were taking their, their shares of FTT, the, this cryptocurrency, and they were borrowing against those in terms of real money. So it looks like money laundering. It looks like embezzlement. Is, and, and then he was going around and doing like full New York Times deal book seminars with, with folks afterward. It's just amazing, the gall of Sam Bankman Fried. It is also amazing that regulators had nothing to say about this until it all collapsed overnight when the largest cryptocurrency exchange, which owned a, a share, a large share of the second largest cryptocurrency exchange, basically spurred a run on the cryptocurrency exchange, FTX, in which everybody said, I want my money out. And Sam Bankman was like, well, your money isn't here anymore. Oopsie. And it turns out that billions and billions of dollars went missing. So Sam Bankman fried is going to face criminal charges in the United States. Meanwhile, in other tech news, Elon Musk continues to roll out more and more information about how Twitter was run. We, have, we now have a five, uh, a fifth part of the, of the, exposure of old Twitter. Musk has handed it over to my friend Barry Weiss. Barry is, I think it's fair to say, a political centrist. She's certainly no conservative, despite the best attempts of the media to paint her as such. Well, Barry has more details on Donald Trump's banning from Twitter. Again, this is highly relevant because as we discussed yesterday, the big tech companies have largely been run by people of the left, and they've been using technology as a way to obscure the biases that they've been implementing in policy. So Barry Weiss has an entire thread that she put out yesterday talking about exactly how Donald Trump was banned from Twitter. And the answer is it's really, really ugly. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, don't be distracted by parties and presents this holiday season. Instead, join Hallow's most anticipated prayer challenge of the year, Pray 25. Hallow is the number one Christian prayer app in the United States and the number one Catholic app in the world. Hallow features over 5,000 prayers and meditations, including the Rosary with Bishop Barron and Mark Wahlberg, the Bible in a Year with Father Mike Schmidt, and Bible bedtime stories with Jonathan Rumi. Hallow helps many of my Christian employees make prayer a priority. This Christmas with Pray 25, it can do the same for you. Led by cast members from The Chosen, the largest Christian streaming series in history, Pray 25 will guide you through meditation and prayer for 25 days leading up to Christmas. 
Pray 25 will help grow your understanding of mankind and develop the disciplined prayer habit during a season when discipline is put to the test. Find peace and fortify your Christian faith this holiday season with Hallow. Download the app for free. Join the Pray 25 Challenge. Go to hallow.com slash Shapiro. Get three months completely free. I've always been a big advocate for Christians becoming more religious, re-engaging with their own faith. Head on over to hallow.com. Make it happen. That's hallow.com slash Shapiro. It's reclaiming your peace during this holiday season. Hallow.com slash Shapiro. So here's what Barry Weiss says. Quote, on the morning of January 8th, President Donald Trump, with one remaining strike before being at risk of permanent suspension from Twitter, tweeted twice. First, he tweeted, the 75,000 great American patriots who voted for me, America first, and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape, or form. And then he tweeted again about an hour later, to all those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January 20th. Barry Weiss says, for years, Twitter had resisted calls of both internal and external to ban Trump on the grounds that blocking a world leader from the platform or removing their controversial tweets would hide important information that people should be able to see in debate. They said, for example, quote, our mission is to provide a forum that enables people to be informed and to engage their leaders directly. This is in 2019. Twitter said that its aim was, quote, to protect the public's right to hear from their leaders and to hold them to account. But after January 6th, Pressure grew both inside and outside of Twitter to ban Trump. There were dissenters inside of Twitter. In fact, one of the dissenters was from China and said, quote, I deeply understand how censorship can destroy the public conversation. But voices like that one appeared to have been a distinct minority within the company. Across Slack channels, many Twitter employees were upset Trump hadn't been banned earlier. After January 6th, says Barry Weiss, Twitter employees organized to demand their employer ban Trump. There's a lot of employee advocacy happening, said one Twitter employee. And, and again, there's this inside-outside game that gets played at a lot of corporations these days where you have left-leaning corporate executives who still feel bound by corporate dictates and by the dictates of the market, but they get pressure from the bottom, from their employees, and they say, well, we have to please our employees. The purple-haired intern with seven earrings, a nose ring, and a face tattoo, we have to, we have to make sure that that person is very pleased with us. Here's the way a normal company works. If my employees here at Daily Wire decided that they did not like the editorial direction of the company and decided that they were going to be very angry and yell about it, well, they have two choices. They can either come to work and do their work or they can leave. There's no third choice where they get to run the editorial direction of the company. That's not how any of this works. But apparently, at a lot of these big tech companies, they decided, and this is because, again, they sympathize with their own employees, that they use the whining of their employees as an excuse to do what they wanted to do in the first place, which is to ban Trump. One staffer said, we have to do the right thing and ban this account. Quote, it's pretty obvious he's going to try to thread the needle of incitement without violating the rules. In the early afternoon of January 8th, Barry Weiss reveals, the Washington Post published an open letter signed by over 300 Twitter employees to CEO Jack Dorsey demanding Trump's ban. We must examine Twitter's complicity in what President-elect Biden has rightly termed insurrection. Now again, if my employees decided that they were going to write a letter, like an open letter, and sign it with their names to the New York Times criticizing the editorial policy of this company, the door is right there. They can leave anytime they choose. But that's not what Jack Dorsey and Twitter did. The Twitter staff assigned to evaluate tweets quickly concluded Trump had not violated Twitter's policies. Quote, I think we'd have a hard time saying this is incitement, wrote one staffer. It's pretty clear he's saying the American patriots are the ones who voted for him, not the terrorists. We can call them that, right, from Wednesday. Another staffer agreed, quote, don't see the incitement angle here. A Twitter policy official named Anika Navaroli said, I'm not seeing clear or coded incitement in the Donald J. Trump tweet. I'll respond in the elections channel and say our team has assessed and found no violations for the DJT one. And then she did that. She says safety has assessed the tweet above and determined there is no violation of our policies at this time. Later, Navaroli would testify to the House January 6th committee for months. I'd been begging and anticipating and attempting to raise the reality that if nothing, if we made no intervention into what I saw occurring, people were going to die. Then Twitter's safety team decided that Trump's tweet is also not in violation. His later tweet was not in violation. They said it's a clear no vio. It's just to say he's not attending the inauguration. Barry Weiss says, to understand Twitter's decision to ban Trump, we must consider how Twitter deals with other heads of state and political leaders, including in Iran, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. So, for example, in June 2018, Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei tweeted, quote, Israel is a malignant cancerous tumor in the West Asian region that has to be removed and eradicated. It is possible and it will happen. Twitter, didn't, Twitter did not delete the tweet and they didn't ban the Ayatollah. In October 2020, the former Malaysian prime minister said it was a right for Muslims to kill millions of French people. Twitter deleted his tweet for glorifying violence, but he remained on the platform. Mohamed Buhari, the president of Nigeria, incited violence against pro-Biafra groups. Quote, those of us in the fields for 30 months who went through the war will treat them in the language they understand. Twitter deleted that tweet, but they didn't ban Buhari. In October 2021, Twitter allowed Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed to call on citizens to take up arms against the Tigray region. Twitter allowed the tweet to remain up and didn't ban the prime minister. 
In early February 2021, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government threatened to arrest Twitter employees in India and to incarcerate them for up to seven years after they restored hundreds of accounts that had been critical of him and Twitter didn't ban Modi. But Twitter executives did ban Trump, even though key staffers said Trump had not incited violence, not even in a coded way. Less than 90 minutes after Twitter employees had determined that Trump's tweets were not in violation of Twitter policy, Vijaya Gaddy, Twitter's head of legal policy and trust, asked whether it could, in fact, be coded incitement to further violence. A few minutes later, Twitter employees on the scaled enforcement team suggested Trump's tweet may have violated Twitter's glorification of violence policy if you interpreted the phrase American patriots to refer to the rioters. And then things escalated from there. Members of that same safety and trust team came to, quote, view him as the leader of a terrorist group responsible for violence and deaths comparable to Christchurch shooter or Hitler. And on that basis and on the totality of his tweets, he should be deplatformed. So Donald Trump tweeted out, just to get this straight, that the, that the American patriots would not be denied and that he wouldn't be going to the inauguration. And this made him comparable to Hitler, according to Twitter employees. And so he had to be banned on that basis. Two hours after that, Twitter executives hosted a 30-minute all-staff meeting. Jack Dorsey and Vijaya Gaddy answered staff questions as to why Trump had not yet been banned. But some employees got angrier. Yoel Roth, who again is one of the bad guys in this whole story, relayed to a colleague, quote, multiple tweets, that'd be Twitter employees, have quoted the banality of evil, suggesting that people implementing our policies are like Nazis following orders. So in other words, allowing Donald Trump to remain on the platform, that is like Nazis following orders. Dorsey requested simpler language to explain why Trump would be suspended. And Roth wrote, God help us. This makes me think he wants to share it publicly. <laughs> oh, you mean you mean you should have to share publicly why you were banning the sitting president of the United States from Twitter? And Yoel Roth is mad about this? Interesting stuff. One hour later, Twitter announced Trump's permanent suspension, quote, due to the risk of further incitement of violence. Many at Twitter was, were ecstatic and congratulatory. By the next day, employees expressed eagerness to tackle medical misinformation as soon as possible, because this is the way that it works. If you feed the alligator, the alligator continues to eat. And so they immediately decided, who can we go after next? Who can we ban next? All righty, guys, the rest of the show is continuing right now. You're not going to want to miss it. We'll be getting into Kristen Cinema declaring that she is an independent and Bernie Sanders declaring that he might back a Democrat against her in Arizona. Plus, we'll get into the mailbag. If you're not a member, click the link in the description and join us.